SRAM. And it stands for Static Random Access Memory. Now this is going to be a read-write memory, and the RAM stands for Random Access, meaning that you put out an address in any of any of the locations, and it will spit back the information. Okay? This is what is used for cache on microprocessors. Okay? This turns out to be the driving force behind Moore's law. Does anybody remember Moore's law? This is that the number of transistors on an integrated circuit will double every 18 to 24 months. And so it's just been increasing, increasing. They started off with the first microprocessor, 2,300 transistors in 1971. And now we're at how many transistors on a microprocessor? Billions, okay, it's, it's billions. Well, it turns out that SRAM, or the on-chip memory, the fast memory, the cache, that's what drives the number of transistors on a chip because you pack them in in such an efficient layout pattern. Okay, So here is the architecture for an SRAM. What you do is you literally take an inverter, and then you take another inverter. And what you do is you put them in a positive feedback configuration. So I'm going to take this baby. I'm going to run it back to here. I'm going to take this baby, run it over here, and here we go. You might re remember this from when we first looked at sequential logic in 261. This is a cross-coupled inverter pair. But the magic of this is that what? If I came in here and was able to stuff a 1 right here, what would happen is that you would have a 0 right here, that 0 would come over to here, it would then go into this inverter, produce a 1, and the 1 would reinforce itself. If you came in and said, no, nah, how about we put a zero here, then the zero would become a one, the one would be routed down to here, the one would become a zero, and it would reinforce itself. So this is a storage element that as long as we can put ones and zeros into it, it will save. Okay? The way that you build an SRAM or an SRAM cell is you just need a way to access the internals of this baby in order to read and write the contents. Okay? So here's what we do. This puppy right here, actually I should have drawn it. Yeah, that's fine. I'll do it like this. So this right here is the SRAM cell, and these are known as access transistors. Now, we always do like, you know how like a resistor, you give it a reference designator, R1, R2. These are M1, M2. So whenever you see transistors in here, it's M. Do you know what the M stands for? To use it in spice, it stands for m m <laughs> MOSFET, yes, yes, thank you. Now, here, these are called access transistors, and what you do is the following. If you want to see what's in the cell or write to the cell, you are going to access it with these vertical traveling bit lines. And this one right here, we'll call it bit line. And this one over here is going to be bit line bar. So this one right here is always going to be the opposite of this one, just due to the way that the inverter works. Okay? If this one has a 1 over here, this is going to be a 0. It's kind of nice because you have two copies of the actual information in there. Then what you do is just like in all the other cells or all the other storage arrays, what you do is you have a word line that runs horizontally over here, and this then controls the access transistors. So you can think about if you wanted to read from this, what you would do is you would simply open up the, or excuse me, close these transistors, and now you basically can see the contents in there. Then you would have devices on the bit lines which would read. So they would be inputs. Okay? Then if you wanted to write to it, what you would do is you would then say, OK, go ahead and close those transistors. And you would drive information in a complementary pattern into the cell. All right? Life is good. If you open these transistors, what will the information do? It will stay there. And what's really nice about a SRAM or a static RAM is that these inverters, if you remember what's inside of them, I mean, they have power supplies, right? So they're sitting right here, and it is continually reinforcing the 1 and the 0 
So you don't have to ever do anything with it. As long as this has power, the one or the zero that this cell is storing will stay there. Does that feel good? All right, life is good. Here is what it looks like a little bit more formally. I drew this out earlier today. If you look at this now, you'll see a very similar looking thing. We're going to have our row address decoder. The address always comes in as a binary code that represents one, what do you call it, row within the array. So if this has two address lines, you're going to have two to the n rows, one hot decoder. Then each of the cells that sit in here are connected to a word line, just like in a ROM. The big difference becomes when you look at how you access the cell itself, you are going to have two bit lines per column. So for example, this column right here, where you're going to access, let's say, bits three of all these rows, you will have a bit line three and a bit line three bar. Down here, you are going to have a circuit that is both a driver and a receiver. We've already looked at this, right? This is the whole concept of a transceiver. Within a transceiver, though, is nothing more than a receiver that is hooked onto it. That does nothing. You can always read from these because the input to this guy is high impedance. Remember these terms? Okay, so when you hook on as a receiver, you don't influence anything. When you drive it, though, okay, you can drive information onto these lines. The problem is that you can't drive it all the time. Because if you're driving onto here and you're trying to read from a cell, you're just going to read whatever you're driving on. So it doesn't work. That means that when you write, you have to have the ability to drive the bit lines and also go into what mode? High impedance mode. So as a result, what you have is you have a control signal which puts the driver, the three state driver, which the three states are 0, 1, and high impedance, into high impedance. This means that when you have a read-write array, you have to have a signal which tells it whether you are reading or writing. Doesn't that make sense? OK. So that's where you actually have this signal that comes in, and we call it a write signal. So if the write is asserted, that means you are going to drive information into the cells. OK? All right, life is good. They are called differential drivers because they produce two copies of the information. So if you wanted to drive a one into these cells, you would need, to, or let's say you want to drive a one into this cell, you would put bit line three as a one, but you would also have to put bit line three not as a zero. So that's why you see these little drivers, and they start kind of looking like, they look like op amps, don't they? They have the little plus and the minus on there. And it's nothing special. All it is is a triangle. And within there, you're going to have just a regular logic circuit and its complement. So you'd have like a buffer and an inverter. And it's nothing special. It's, it's not an op amp, but we just have to signify that it is differential. So you do it by having two inputs and two outputs in the plus and the minus. Does that feel good? All right. How's that feel? Good. <laughs> All right. It's pretty simple. You know, an SRAM is really simple. This is what the cache memory is, and the reason that it is so dense is because of the regular pattern. Okay, look at how you pack these puppies in there. How much cache is on your processor today? Isn't that interesting? So, 8 megs. Okay, think about that. When I ask you what your computer is, and you say, how much memory does your computer have? What are the numbers you're saying? 16 gigs, right? I mean, there's huge amounts of gigs, okay? But when you talk about this type of memory, this is the memory that makes your computer run the fastest, okay? This is the L1 cache that sits right next to the microprocessor. This is measured in megabytes, okay? So eight megabytes. It's a different type of technology, super fast. This is the fastest memory you can get. A D flip-flop is your fastest, buddy. The SRAM is then your second fastest memory, and then you move on to the third and fourth fastest memories. Okay? But this is super dense. This is way, way more dense than a D flip-flop. Does that feel good? But do you have the capability to do things like a D flip-flop? Let me ask you this. Is there a reset in this memory array? No. 
When it fires up, you don't know what's, go what's in the memory. In a read-write memory, you have no idea what's going on on power-up. Okay? You would have to write zeros to them all if you wanted to effectively reset the memory. You never do that, though. You just keep track when you're writing to it, if you've writ written to it, and then you can read from it later. Feel good? OK. Good! Now, I have some awesome pictures. We won't go through it in detail, but I just want to share these with you because they're so awesome. I have a picture where I show writing to this row. Okay? So we had to assert this word line, which opened up all of the access transistors. And then we drove onto it these four bits that then had to be converted into a differential signal and that rode into there. And then you're driving it. And if you want to store it, what do you think the next step would be? You would take the word line, and instead of making it a 1, you'd make it a 0, and the information stays. OK? Nice. If you wanted to read from that array, all you would do is assert a word line of some other row, and then you would use these puppies right here, these differential receivers, in order to read out and convert it back to the single bit. Feel good? All right. Life is good. Let me ask you a question. How many transistors does this take? Two, two, two. There are two transistors in an inverter, in a CMOS inverter. There's one PMOS, one NMOS. So this is actually referred to as a 6T cell, six transistors. 